start off with two sort of homilies or anecdotes, uh, since Martin has already gone down that road. The first one is, <clears throat> um, I had an input into the title of today's talk, so you can assume that it is chosen carefully. And um, <clears throat> so carefully, in fact, that a short answer is none. And you could all go home very, very short. I say that because uh, what, we're, what the new treaty is about is about the transposition into domestic law of EU law. I spent a lot of time learning about the reverse. Uh, the trans um, and in fact, when I started many years ago, working in the civil service, one of the, we were transposing directives, and regulations were even more fearful things because they automatically applied and superseded national law. So this has now been turned on its head, and we have EU regulations which are now being transposed into domestic laws, um, preferably at constitutional, but not necessarily at constitutional level. And a, a short response to what's going on would be that this treaty is, a, is about uh, domesticizing EU law. And that, with a few exceptions, which I'll go into in a minute, all, all, virtually all of its provisions are already there. The other thing about it is that the, the existing provisions uh, are quite specific in that a country in a program like Ireland, Greece, and Portugal, um, th these rules stop and, 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 and the rules of the program apply. So in a way, it, in a narrower sense, this stuff is not at all applicable to the program countries, one could argue. And after the program, which in our case ends in 2015, there's a three-year transition period before the debt uh, criterion kicks in. And the debt criterion in our case, the, the new criterion, which is already in EU law, is a reduction of 1 20th per annum over a 20-year period. The, the 1 one twentieth of what, you may well ask? 1 twentieth of the difference between the reference rate, which is 60% of GDP, and the rate which will be then, which for argument for today's purposes we take as 1 20. Uh, it will, hopefully won't be that high. So in other words, there's a 60% reduction to be gleaned over a 20-year period, which is 3% per annum. So therefore, we have three years to go in the program, three years grace, that's six, followed by 20, that's 26. So for the next 26 years, this treaty would be more or less irrelevant. To Ireland and Greece and Portugal. That, that's my first point. It's slightly overstated, but um, that's deliberately so to, to, to provoke your thoughts. The other thing is that today, um, unfortunately, this is, this is a, a rather turgid presentation in some respects uh, and has to do a lot with models. So I want to tell you uh, something about models that I learned many, many, many years ago when I was a young lad in the Department of Finance doing tax revenue forecasting. Uh, we had a method of doing it, which we used to call the back of the envelope. And um, it, 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 it was so, and everybody was very interested in it, obviously for obvious reasons. There was another young lad in the Revenue Commission at the time who was uh, called Donald the Butler, and uh, our objective was always to make his estimates more uh, optimistic. Were his on the front of the envelope? <clears throat> his, his, his were inside it, actually. <laughs> uh, but um, along came a third gentleman whose name was John Fitzgerald, who was also there, and he produced the first model that the department used, and it was called Cerberus, after the multi-headed watchdog of the underworld. And um, the, the, the management thought this was a magnificent uh, uh, success and an achievement and something entirely new. So we were told, you must use this. And I was given the job of investigating it. So eventually, after, unfortunately, I studied econometrics then, I've forgotten them in the meantime, uh, I, I sort of decomposed it into its elements, and I found that the model was vastly more simplistic than our back of the envelope method. So that gave me a healthy skepticism for uh, models. And I remain so today. They're useful uh, for running simulations. But in terms of forecasting, you have to be extremely careful. Now, today I'm going to start off uh, with um, a nod to our Greek colleagues who are also in programs and in somewhat uh, greater uh, Ah, here we go. Oh, you forget about that one. Uh, uh, some parts, uh, less auspicious circumstances than us even. The first slide here is the Greek debt PSI, public private sector involvement. Basically, this is a write down of the Greek debt. There's 350 billion of Greek debt. 200 of it is eligible for write down because it's held by, by um, basically non official holders. You can see the breakdown that the ECB have 55 billion, the Troika have 65, and there's other bits and pieces. That leaves 200. Most of that 200 is in the hands of foreigners, and it's about 23 billion in Greek pension funds and about 
47 in Greek banks. So you can see who's getting the hit there, and you can also see the way it reduces. It's 100 million. And then there's a collateral, which is a complicated thing that has to be posted as part of the arrangement. So net-net, they get 70. But why do I wa waste your time talking about that? It's really to get to the next slide. The IMF last November... Uh, simulated this, and these simulations are still reasonable, although a bit out of date, and the situation is now a bit more pessimistic than it was then. Um, in the absence of action, the Greek debt would rise to well over 180%. With the 50% haircut, which is proposed and currently being negotiated, the red line kicks in, and you can see what it does. It gets them back to 120% by the year 2020, I think it is. Uh, in fact, it's slightly over 120% if you look closely. And I put that there to compare Ireland, because Ireland then, then and now, the, figure, the green line hasn't changed much, we're peaking around about 120%. So this is my, I start and I end on an optimistic note. Um, my, um, in other words, the, 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 all the talks you're reading about these are designed to get the Greeks to where we are roughly going to be. And I am going to leave that one hang there for the moment. At that, at that. Now, uh, the Department of Finance doesn't like models, <laughs> certainly when it comes to structural budget balances, uh, they're no big fan of them, for very good reasons. This is a quote I found back in the 2001 budget. Um, Estimations of the structural budget balance and other such measures of the appropriateness of the budgetary stance require to be treated with caution. The language is a bit archaic. Much more important in terms of evaluating the appropriateness of policy are the real measures of the general government surplus and the general government debt. So they're saying, look at the facts. Don't bother me with these hidden things that are difficult to estimate, these underlying structural, cyclically adjusted uh, thing. So that's what they said back then. Now, so how did we do? I decided to start off by looking at that. Uh, here's the, the, at that stage, of course, there, was, there were two criteria. There was a 3% budget deficit. By the way, it's amusing. Uh, I've listened to RTE to this week in politics on Sunday night. I listened to Pat Kenny yesterday morning. The confusion about the 3% and the 0.5% is virtually total. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the only one I heard attempt to correct it was Leo Varadkar, and he didn't make a great job of it either. So you can assume that many people now think that what we're restricted to in future is a half percent deficit. And of course, that is completely incorrect. The 3% is there and stands. That's the first point. So how did we do? Well, here is our general government balance, which is the, way, the measure for this purpose. You, and the deficit, the limit is 3, which is the dotted line. And the green line was Ireland. So we didn't come near the 3. That's the first point. At any stage during the boom, the Celtic Targa boom or the property bubble or anything else. And I put in Germany there for good measure. And you will note that her good friends, the Germans, didn't have as good a record. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you looked at the structural balance, and we'll come to the definition of that in a minute, but we'll just take it for now, how did Ireland do? If, it, if the half percent limit had been in place, and it was since 1995, actually, and, and informally before that, as some of the audience will testify, we dipped below it briefly, but in essence we respected that too, whereas in essence the Germans didn't. So, so that's the, if, if you were to take the Department of Finance at its word and say, how did we do? The debt criterion I didn't bother, bother putting up there, by the way, because obviously the limit was 60, and we got our debt down to 25%. So we massively outperformed on the debt criterion. Um, and so as far as the rules were concerned, we, we obeyed the rules. And it's not something you often hear. You do hear a bit. If you looked at the Regling report in Ireland, on, on, he said the fiscal policy was pro-cyclical. You could have a session here on whether or not that statement is correct, actually. Uh, my answer, having looked at it, is it's partially correct. Uh, there were some years when you could argue it was pro-cyclical and others when it was not. It certainly wasn't pro-cyclical more than two or three years out of the total. All right? Now... But it depends on how you define pro-cyclical. In my case, I'm defining it as uh, increasing the structural deficit at a time when the, when the economy is overheating. Uh, so let's go on. Now, so what's next? Like, let's go to the treaty now. What's new in the new treaty? And my answer to that is very little except, and I think it's the except bit we should look for. Well, first of all, as I've already outlined, they're putting EU law into national law, preferably at constitutional level. That is a definite change. And I'm not a legal expert, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but I think we're all aware of that. The second thing in it, which was mentioned here last week by a visiting EU official, was the use of the reverse qualified majority voting to trigger the whole EDP process. That is, is, not, that is a new thing. 
which is in the treaty as it stands and is not formally there in the existing EU law, including in the six pack, which revised the Stability and Growth Pact. And, and, and these revisions came into effect on the 13th of December last, fairly recent. The other thing, which the correction mechanism is now triggered automatically. It says in the treaty, in the draft of last Thursday, I think it was, that the correction mechanism would be triggered automatically. So there's all this convoluted business of the commission forming an opinion and toing and froing, and the documentation, I can tell you, is, is, is very difficult to absorb. There's a simple statement. It's triggered automatically, and the member states are expected to have a procedure in place to deal with it. So that is, some, that is a change there. It might, in, in practical terms, be a huge change, but it is a change. Uh, the, the next one is a very important one, I think. Only those who signed the treaty will get access to the ESM. The ESM is the Permanent Bailout Fund, the European Stability Mechanism. Uh, it replaces the EFSF, which is the temporary one, which we we've had, uh, uh, have at the moment. And if, er if any country, like Ireland, for example, had to go for a second bailout, uh, we could have another whole hour's debate on that, uh, they'd be going to the ESM. So I think that's, that's potentially a significant one. If you don't sign the treaty, you might not get uh, access to the funds. The other thing is, the, at the insistence of Germany, the European Court of Justice has been involved in this process. It's not, as was incorrectly said in several media things I heard recently, uh, going to rule on whether we're running a, a deficit or not, uh, and whether the deficit is appropriate or not, but it is going to rule on whether the requirements of the treaty have been transposed into domestic law properly and, and in time. And, and if that's not done, there can be this provision even for a fine of not, up to 0.1% of GDP, which will go to the ESM, the, this, the new bailout fund, something which is worrying the Danes at the moment. They don't see why they should potentially have to pay money into an e, a Eurozone bailout fund that they're not party to. But anyway, um, and then there's uh, also on the discussion uh, over the weekend is part and uh, the Council Finance Ministers yesterday is the participation of the non-Euro members, like the Danes themselves, in Eurozone summits. They want a greater role. They've been kept out of the picture until now, and that's delicate apparently and is currently under discussion. And then finally, although there's nothing new in the last one there, uh, whereas the new treaty refers back frequently to existing legis EU legislation, it fails to do so in the case of the structural <coughs> budget balances. It actually defines what a structural budget balance is, which wasn't formally defined before, as far as I can see. But the 0.5 and the 1% were already in existing legislation. I'll show you that in a minute. But they're formally referred to yet again. I gather this is part of the, it's the old Irish one, to be sure, to be sure. They're copper fastening things as they go along. Now, the six pack, which entered into effect in, the, in December last, was, was a major upgrade of the Stability and Growth Pact. And uh, it took over a year to do. It, most of this stuff is already in it. Penalties for breaches by the reverse qualified majority vote, that is there already. The 60% de deficit, the 60 debt limit, which was ignored completely over the preceding 10 years, has now been given the same status as the deficit criterion, the 3% deficit. Uh, and and, and, and um, so you now have real rules kicking in and they would have kicked in if there never was a treaty uh, to operationalize this debt criterion. And that's why I go back to what I said at the outset. The criterion it here provided is 1 20th of an angle reduction, and it's 1 20th of the average over three years, just to make it interesting. Um, so that is a new and a major thing, which will affect all our lives. As I remember the 26 years I mentioned uh, at the outset. Uh, now, the, there's a peculiar thing in it, the annual spend growth capped at a medium-term growth rate. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that sits now in the light of the latest treaty, but it is there, although the EU officials would claim that there's no actual restriction on spending, provided you finance it by increased revenue. Uh, that's an important thing uh, to get across. Uh, there's stronger enforcement action. The fines are bigger, more automatic, come earlier, basically. And they're up to 2% of GDP. You can lose if you don't play the, by the rules. And this has nothing to do with the treaty. This is the six-pack, which is already in power, enforced. You can lose 2% of your GDP. Initially, it's a an interest-bearing deposit. Then it becomes a non-interest-bearing deposit. And finally, it becomes a fine. And where does it go? It goes off to the new bailout fund. 
right? And it, it's, that has always been a peculiar notion. Somebody who's excessive deficits, their deficits are too big, you're, you're fining them by actually charging them money, which exacerbates the deficit, of course, but there you go. It's never been done, needless to say. Um, so stronger and earlier preventive action. And then there's a new, like I showed you earlier that we obeyed the rules. So there must have been something wrong if Ireland and other countries, you know, sailed lightly through this, this fog and ended up in the mess we've ended up in. And to, to capture that in future, there's a new excessive imbalances procedure. And again, that goes with fines, but park that for a moment. The op to operationalize that, there will be an early warning scoreboard of 10 macroeconomic indicators, which will trigger, when a threshold is hit, it will trigger in-depth studies and missions to the countries concerned, and the missions may involve the ECB. They don't actually mention the IMF, as far as I remember. So what is going on here? Well, this is the scoreboard to give you a flavor. Uh, and this is why Catherine Day, who was here recently, but was a year ago, was also in Dublin. I remember her saying, had the new rules been in place, we would have uh, copped that Ireland was doing something it shouldn't have been doing. And this is why she will have said it, I'm sure. There's a, I'm going to just run through these. There's a three-year moving average of the balance of payments current account. And the tr threshold limits are, if it's a plus 6% on one side or a deficit of 4% on the other, that tr that they start looking at it. The net international investment position, again, with a threshold of 35% of GDP. Um, a five-year average of your export market shares, if, the, if it goes down by more than 6%, something begins to happen. A three-year percentage change in unit labor costs with a threshold of 9% for Euro countries and, and a, less, uh, a bigger one for non-Euro countries. Um, real effective exchange rates, basically your competitiveness, uh, it's, it's linked to the ULCs. Here again, a three-year change with a threshold of plus or minus 5%. And then you have private sector debt, which of course is important in Ireland, uh, with a threshold of 160%. Private sector credit flow, as a percentage of GDP with a threshold of 15. You'll remember when our credit was growing at 30% for many years, you know, you can see, well, I want to, uh, above 50%, 15% per annum, you'd have the buys would be in town. And in future, house prices, the, the, the price adjusted real change, threshold of 6% uh, per annum there. General government debt, once it goes above 60% of GDP, once it, that's the, the, the limit in the treaty, they start looking at you, and finally a three-year moving average of unemployment with a threshold of 10%. Now, you get the picture. Do you, do you think they threw in the kitchen sink? You know, there's, a, there's an element of that, I think, in these. Uh, in other words, there's going to be a fairly intensive surveillance uh, procedure in the future under the existing law. Okay, so the structural budget balance rule. Um, I said it's more or less there, so let's just look at what I said. The old SGP, back, that's the Stability and Growth Pact, back in 1997 had the first quote there in it. It said, adherence to the objective of sound budgetary positions close to balance or in surplus, and that's the key, will allow all member states to deal with normal cyclical fluctuations while keeping the government deficit within the value of 3% of GDP. In uh, something changed in 2005, I haven't put it in, A, because I didn't have space, and B, because I don't fully understand it, but they did, it's an, it seems to be an informal guide brought in the 0.5% at that stage, and each country got a, a, an MTO. I tend to think it was an MBO, but an MTO is a medium-term budgetary objective, and they were introduced then, and Ireland got one, and we got a limit of 0.5% in it, so that's really... Although it was informal, it became less informal from then on, and it's referred to in our the stability programs that we submit each year to the EU. But um, leaving that aside and going on to 2011, in November 2011, in this regulation, the country-specific medium-term budget objective shall be specified within a defined range between minus 1% and balance or surplus in cyclically adjusted terms a net of one-off. When you net of one-off, you get the structural one. Uh, otherwise, it's cyclical adjusted. So you see there, it, it became very specific and very formal. So the minus one is the outside, and that's for the extremely good lads in the class who have very low debt ratios and are well below the 3% deficit ceiling. They get a little bit extra leeway, like you could expect Germany perhaps in the future, but not in the past to get... Luxembourg would be a good example, I think, of someone who would get the extra leeway should they need it. Um, so in Ireland, so since 2005, we've had the half percent, uh, more or less formally, 
And anyway, it's, it's, it's written into law, certainly in 2011. Now the treaty comes along and says, last Thursday's draft at least, the budgetary position of the general government shall be balanced or in surplus, nothing new there. This shall be deemed to be respected if the annual structural balance of the general government is at its country-specific medium-term objective. That's the MTO, the medium-term objective, as defined in the revised Stability and Growth Pact with the annual structural deficit not exceeding 0.5% of GDP. So what they're doing is they're taking something that is already in an EU regulation, uh, but not quite as precise, but is already there behind that regulation, and they're, they're putting it into the Constitution, as the Germans would have it. I doubt if it'll go into the Irish Constitution, but that's not my area. Okay, come back now to the Department of Finance and the critiques uh, of the structural budget balances. This is Budget 2001. It was the most extensive uh, operation. Uh, I wonder who was there at that stage. Uh, first, with large structural changes having taken place, it's difficult to establish that there is an identifiable Irish economic cycle. Second, it's difficult to reliably establish what is the sustainable trend rate of economic growth in Ireland because of shifts in productivity, labour force and migration patterns. Third, there's a large degree of uncertainty regarding, the trend, regarding trend growth estimates generally. Fourth, there's a weak correlation between measures of the output gap and inflation in Ireland, given the importance of external factors in determining blah, blah. Fifth, the cyclically adjusted budget balance indicator is backward-looking rather than forward-looking, because it's based on statistics, so necessary. The key issue is where, whether a country is expected to be over, say, three years ahead, uh, where it's expected to be, not some notional trend estimate. Uh, and sixth, the CABB does not take into account the impact of changes in EU funding and national budgets. Now, the reference to trend there is there because at that stage, they had a different way of calculating all of this um, output gaps, etc. They were using trend rather than a production function. And we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, this was April 2011, to bring it up to date rel relatively recently. The cyclical position is determined on the basis of harmonised production function methodology. That had appeared in the meantime, around about 2003 or 4. The first step is to determine potential output by reference to the available quantities of capital and labour, together with trend productivity at the TFP, total factor productivity level. The difference between the potential and the trend is your output gap. Fairly straightforward. The general government balance then is decomposed into two bits. Um, now, at this stage in, in April 11, the Department of Finance said in the budget, the difficulties of estimating potential growth are evidenced by the wide range of current estimates, ESRI 3%, EU Kirka 1.5%. I think the ESRI probably changed in a minute. In the meantime, I have another slide on that in a moment. Um, anyway, the implication latter was a positive output gap. That means the economy is overheating of 4.5% of GDP in 2015. This result is not viewed as plausible. And that's about as, 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 as near to the straight talking Martin mentioned at the outset as the Department of Finance will ever get in a budget document. Nevertheless, it's clear that a significant part of the deficit is structural. I, think, I don't think anyone would really disagree with that. And therefore, the implication of being structural means you have to eliminate it by taking measures, i.e. reducing spending or increasing taxes. I think that's, and that's the significance of that. Now, am I boring you with all this technical stuff? Are you, has everybody lost at this stage? Uh, to give you an idea, of, th there are many difficulties in estimating these things, but the economy, you know, history changes first of all, because the CSO continually revise uh, the, 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 the estimates of output initially. But a forecast, it's even worse when you start getting to forecast. This here it shows you, is, oh, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I thought about the pointer on this, is there? No, isn't it? No. Um, for 2000, focus on the centre column there, 2011-15. I just had, for another reason, a range of forecasts for that period. It's an average period of, like, it's four, four years of at least, or five. Uh, back in 2005, the ESRI in their medium-term review, or medium-term outlook, said uh, estimated growth at 4.3%. Three years later, they were at 3.8. One year later, they were up at 5.4. The Department of Finance in 2009-10 came in around the 3.7 mark. The ESRI in the middle of 2010 was at 4.2, uh, or 3, depending whether you took the high or low. The budget of 2011 had 2.2, and interestingly, Although it's not there, the budget of 2012 had more or less the same figure. It's 2.1, I think. And then the IMF in 2010 were at 1.3. That gives you an idea of the difficulty of uh, forecasting and how these figures can change um, around the place. Now, 
the actual structural budget uh, estimates, this is the 2012 budget. GDP growth along there obviously was disappointing in 2012, so they pulled it back. But the interesting thing is they let it back up to three in 14 and 15. And uh, you know, that's, there's a question mark, what is the potential growth of the economy? Uh, we'll see in a minute how others differ. The potential growth according to the budget uh, varies in the year, but creeps up to 1.8% in 2015. Now, the output gap I said earlier is the difference between potential and actual, uh, and it's a stock, not a flow concept. So it tells you, you know, your GDP is X billion too low at the moment by reference to what it should be, or too high even. Um, and you can see the deficit there. There's minus 10, minus 9, minus 8, minus 5, minus 3. So, uh, the, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. The output gap, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, etc. Then they have the, the general government balance, which is the 8.6% target for this year. Interest spending, one-off measures, cyclic. Now, we need, this is the part, point of all this. Decomposition of the deficit into cyclical and structural, which we've been talking about. The cyclical component is quite simply 40% of the output gap. Right, where does that come from? And so there, not alone are there statistical data-related problems with this, there are methodological as well. That was an exercise done by the OECD in 2004, which looked at data for the preceding 10 years. And it worked out the elasticity of tax revenues. Um, it did income tax, corporation tax, indirect taxes, and spending on unemployment. And it put them all together to get an overall elasticity, and then it, got, it adjusted that to get a sensitivity. You know, it was the sensitivity of the budget balance to changes in the, in the, in the, in the output gap. And they, they, the average figure that they got was 40%. So they used that. Now, interestingly enough, of all the EU, of all the Euro countries I compared, Ireland had the lowest sensitivity, although there were others not far from 40%. But so anyway, wherever the output gap is, if the economy is 10% overheating over potential, well then you get 40% of 10%, which is four percentage points, boost to your budget. You're getting extra revenue, basically, to your budget balance now. And vice versa, if your economy is on the other side. Uh, so that's a fairly arbitrary <coughs> thing, but that's the way it's done. And then the structural bit is what's left over, which is what you're supposed to eradicate. Right. I compared these estimates bubble around the place. So I compared 2012 with 2011. I'm not going to bother you with most of these. <coughs> Look at the change of potential growth of half a percent. Of the output gap can change by one to two, two and a half percent. This is within a year. And interest spending, the cyclical, one percent, and so on. So you get the picture. A one percent shift isn't isn't big deal in the context of these estimates. So you have to be careful if you're close to the 0.5 percent limit. That's the part of that. Now if you compare then the Department of Finance with the EU. You can see even greater the output gap. There's a one and a half percent difference in 2013. We're using the same methodology, by the way, but the different inputs, different estimates, I guess. Uh, so, you know, I just say, put those two slides there to show you, give you an indication of the, the difficulty, and I'm back to my modeling thing that I mentioned at the outset. Okay, so here's another way of looking at the output gaps. These are the output gaps for Ireland. How do, do they look intuitive or not? Well, if you go back to the year end of the year 2000, Patrick Cohn of the Government Central Bank have often heard him say, the Irish economy was in broad balance around 2000. And indeed, that seems correct. Certainly from a competitiveness point of view, we were. And maybe that may be the context. But this shows here we had a very uh, positive output gap then, and that the economy was overheating. Then you come forward to 2005 and 2007, where it was the heyday of the bubble. And the, the output gap was there, all right, but it was much lower. You know, so you've got to say to yourself, does that, is that sound right? And you'd say, not so sure. And, but the interesting one of all is this one here. Running out to 2015, again, harking back to an earlier slide, what this shows is that by 2016, we'll have a positive output gap, i.e. the economy will be overheating in 2013. Is it 13? Yeah. 11, 12, yes. Uh, next year. Yeah. Seems hard to quit. How many people think the Irish economy will be overheating next year? Well, I have distinctive views on all that. All right, yeah, all right. Well, anyway, we've got the audience. Uh, now, here, I just put the unemployment rate. Don't forget that next year, unemployment will still be 13%. Now, how do you rationalise that? The answer is structural unemployment, effectively. All those unfortunate people who lost their jobs in construction, they sort of disappear from the model here because they're not going to get jobs in the IT sector where there's actually shortages. 
at the moment. And that's the way this model works. It more or less discounts. So the 13% isn't that relevant uh, to the workings of the model. And indeed, there's probably a lot of truth in that. Uh, here are the EU. I'm, I'm back to the EU now because they're the ones that give you good long runs of data. They sh I was able to get here, well, actual GDP growth, which is in blue, potential, as they calculated in red, and then that's the old trend that they used to use, the green line. And the trend, this was the old filter thing. It, I mean, you just set there's a number and, and you, you change your number to say, do you want the curves to go up and down by more or less? It's, it's that simple. Uh, so th that's what we're, we're operating on here. Um, now, the next thing I looked at was the output gap revision. It's all very well to look back and say the Irish economy was overheating with the benefit from a today's perspective. How did it look at the time is a more interesting question, at least I thought. So on the left of there, real time means the EU autumn forecasts in November to see what they said about the output gap. And now is their latest 2011. And to give you some idea, of, again, of the revisions that I keep talking about due to data and methodology, don't forget. Uh, for example, the change, the, I said total factor productivity was sort of a, was measured as an average, a long-term average. They changed a couple of years ago from uh, a HP filter, Hodgwick Prescott, to a Kalman filter, which I mentioned here at some meeting, Ben Halligan got excited. Um, now, that caused the German output gap to move by about half a percent, causing the Bundesbank to write an article in its monthly review, which you're all welcome to look at, really taking issue with this and saying, it's not good enough. We should go back to the old methodology. So, so but th there you go. Here, look at the differences between the two. The output gap for this changed by as much as 5.5% due to those revisions, which will tell you why I agree with the Department of Finance in their skepticism regarding these type of measurements. And, and, and then a 40% of that impact on the cyclical component, you could have a 2% change in, the, in your cyclical component of the budget as a result of that, with, with implications for policy, potentially. Uh, here's Germany. Just to show you, it's not just Ireland. The, the revisions in the case of Germany are not near as, as steep, but they did get up to 2.5% at, at their peak. Right? Um, now, we're coming to the end, you'll be glad to hear. Um, we end up with a couple of oddities. I mean, there's a big deb I'm listening to these media debates, which are, I think, of very poor quality, I must say, um, you know, about the borrowings of Ireland and how the ECB is doing us down and all of this. So I thought I'd put in a slide to show you just how much the ECB is lending to Ireland. And that's the red bit. Now, it's the monetary policy lending. It includes their normal lending and their ELA, emergency liquidity assistance, which you'd lean from the central bank's balance sheet if they don't tell you exactly what it is. And that money is coming in at the moment at 1%. All right? So anyone who says the ECB isn't doing much really should think about this. Now, it is collateralized, and we could have a long debate on the quality of the collateral, etc. Uh, but the collateral, the value of it is adjusted on a daily basis. And the central bank, in its annual report for 2010, has a note on the emergency liquidity stuff, which is the, uh, the, where the collateral is less value and not standard. Uh, and they say, we had haircuts on this collateral ranging from 5% to 80%, I think. So you can assume, and all of that emergency stuff has to be agreed with the ECB, contrary to what you frequently hear and see expressed. Uh, anyway, so this stuff comes in at 1%. And here, then, is the trika money, which came in last year at an average of 3.7%. So that's what we're paying for our money from these various sources. Now, what's the alternative? I tell you, oh, the alternative is, is borrowing in the market, which at the moment is about 7.5%. Right? Um, and there you have it. You can see, I just put this for interest because you see a lot of now, you know, you see, you see the spike in Irish <coughs> borrowing costs in the, middle, in, 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 in the middle of last year around July. You see where Portugal is now. Since it was downgraded to junk, that was that last jump there recently. Uh, Ireland, you see the, the recovery in Ireland initially, a bit unwinding, and then a steady recovery again, unlike Portugal. So we're now back just about at the low point where we've been uh, since March of last year. Year. Then you see coming in Italy and Spain. They used to be together. This is when the ECB started intervening. It drove Italian and Spanish yields bang down to 5%, which tells you something about where they think uh, they should be. And then they sort of re relaxed when Berlusconi began to act up. 
and uh, they allowed the Italian one in particular to go back up again, and it has stayed up there. Uh, you could call this the Monty effect. It's beginning to come down again. The Spanish one is lower because they have less debt. And then here you have the French. Now, anybody who thinks that France lost its AAA rating last week is gravely mistaken. France lost its AAA rating when a gap came out between these two lines, which was a long time ago, certainly at least at the middle of last year. Uh, and all that the rating agency did was, was to confirm that, which is why there was no movement in borrowing costs after they came out. So anyway, but the alternative for Ireland would be to borrow at seven at the moment. We used to borrow at four and a half to five, so we're still a bit off that. So I'll just put that in for interest. And another common fallacy that you see all the time is we'll never be able to repay the debt. Of course, unlike individuals, Governments never repay debt. And I thought I'd illustrate that by showing you the Irish debt during the heyday of the Celtic Tiger. There were only one, two, three, and a little one here, four years when the actual level of debt de decreased. Mm -hmm. What happens? The debt in good times stays roughly constant, and the GDP goes up. Therefore, debt as a percentage of GDP went down to 25%. Uh, in this period. But you hardly ever see people saying that. And people get very excited, including newly elected TDs, especially newly elected TDs, and I hope there's none of them in the audience, um, about our inability to pay back the debt. What will happen? Well, we have to pay back the Troika, of course. But we, why do you think there's a big uh, excitement about the in 2014 we have a, a debt maturing? We roll it over, and that's, that's just the way it is. Um, now, it, will life ever be the same again? And let me end on this note, I think. Um, once you get, but this chart here is from uh, the document, the medium term financial document published last November by the Department of Finance in advance of the budget. And it basically assumed figures like the 2012 budget. Once you get, and it, it shows you the outlook for the debt, debt, which is the second line from the bottom here, is the one I choose to focus on. There are various alternatives. Um, and this is based on the 2012 budget with a 4.5% cost of borrowing, and no, sorry, 4.5% nominal GDP growth rate, uh, and a 5.2% a interest rate or cost of borrowing, slightly higher. And we, by 2015, we will have, according to the budget, a primary surplus of almost 3%. If you put those three together and you work out, by 2000 and whenever it is here, 30 something, something nine, you'd be back, you are definitely be back at 60%. So I go back to what I said at the start. You know, that's how you get your 120th per annum reduction in debt. Not as some people think, we're going to have to increase income tax for the next 30 years each year. Uh, hopefully, that will not arise. There, I leave you. Thank you. Thank you.